Good afternoon. My name is Veronica Combs, and I'm the editor of MedCity News. Uh, thank you for coming to this industry roundtable. Um, I will let everyone go around the uh, row and introduce themselves, and then we'll start with the questions. I'm Dr. Bill Ludwig from Newview Health. <coughs> Dr. Greg Siaton from Med One Health. I'm Dr. Deb Jeffries, and I'm with Polycom. Manu Varma, I'm with Philips Healthcare. Uh, in, uh, Tim Wright from InTouch Health. Jean-Claude Schenka from Panasonic. So um, everyone seems very optimistic uh, today. Uh, I think I felt a little bit like a grumpy journalist when I was writing my questions, but it seems to be a great time to be in telemedicine and things are kind of finally tipping into everyone gets it. Uh, the last session they said that we're at the end of the beginning. Now our priorities as people interested in telemedicine is the priorities of, of the larger group. So um, uh, what do you think is, what's the most important thing going on right now? What's the biggest sign of progress? Well, I think, just as you said, I think the nation as a whole is beginning to understand the role of telemedicine in healthcare. And I think that was a, and we've been doing it for about eight years now as an outgrowth of doing critical care medicine, but I think six or eight years ago, there was a struggle for acceptance, both on the part of hospital systems, patients, and physicians. And I think more and more we see that people are ready for this. The question is, how do we use it? What's the best way to use it? So that's why I think that's changed. That doesn't mean it's an easy, fix to get it into a system or a healthcare setting, but I think people are willing to listen. Um, literally a day doesn't go by without an article about telemedicine somewhere. So that's really, I think, all positive. I guess what I find most exciting is that we're starting to expand the boundaries of telemedicine. Um, what I do, I'm an emergency physician in the Harvard system in Boston, and my area of expertise is in disaster medicine. And now with the combination of the, uh, the technology that we have, both in communications, uh, the systems that we can put together, we can actually now apply this uh, this telemedicine, this new um, uh, era to um, austere locations and places uh, that would normally either not have access to any health care whatsoever or have access to poor health care. That's one thing that we specialize in Med One Health is the application of telemedicine in austere locations. But I think what's most exciting to me is, is now that we're taking this telemedicine idea and really starting to, to, to blow the boundaries away and, and using it in, in other um, uh, places that, that, you know, maybe even in our wildest dreams earlier on in disaster medicine, we never, never conceived of. Um, I think the most exciting thing now is the fact that unlike, say, the first 10 or 15 years of telemedicine where you focus primarily on a doctor at a distance and a patient getting that consultation that they couldn't get otherwise, that in addition to that today, we're really able to look at how do we support the new model of care? How do we support patient-centered health how do we help reduce those unnecessary rehospitalizations? How do we support the ACO organizations? And I think the most exciting thing, is, as you've mentioned, is the fact that it's now not just a, for example, point-to-point -point video call, but a multi-point interactive collaborative video call and, uh, that enables this team effort. And even to the point that we're excited about the fact that you're going to be able to go out and do population management and have that interaction, the, the fact that you can actually see those other people with the same problems and get that uh, patient to do a little bit better in the long run and impact the healthcare system so that it's less costly to deliver that care. Yeah, I would say the biggest thing is really Affordable Care Act, which turned things on its head. I think it, you know, if you had to look at the two major changes, one is they added a lot of patients on the system, so created a capacity constraint. Um, and they you know, are cutting payments, and uh, you know, there is uh, also, because of accountable care organizations, needing to watch patients not just in their four walls, but outside it. You know, they need to do more, another source of capacity constraint. And what that means is that you know, telemedicine can really step up its game and you know, make providers manage that capacity constraint. And that can happen in the hospital, in the critical care setting. It happens in tele-ICUs, uh, which we've worked on for many years. And it happens in the home care setting where you're managing readmissions or, or you need to care for patients who, who just need long-term support because they're that sick. So I really think uh, the policy has really given this a huge, full of, full of, a big boost, which we are seeing play out. I mean, the biggest example you can look at is AT8 itself. You know, since last year, it looks like a much bigger show, and uh, I expect you know that trend to continue for next several years. Yeah, I don't know. If there's a lot new to say. I think <laughs> uh, you know we're we're all seeing the same thing. I think maybe my only comment would be, 
that <clears throat> we're in a little bit of this chasm between <coughs> the, 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 the new reimbursement models, the new incentives that are what are coming and where there's a lot of excitement and interest and opportunity to redesign care models, um, create uh, integrated delivery models across the continuum. But many organizations are not quite there yet, and they're just thinking about it. And so the, the challenge for telemedicine organizations like ours is you have to know who you're talking to, and you have to, you have to um, really be able to address both market opportunities. So if you're in a traditional, more fee-for-service kind of market where the transition hasn't occurred yet, maybe uh, it's more... Um, uh, uh, you know, not the, not the high innovation kind of markets, then you have to be able to play in that world. And I think, and then you have to adjust your, your, your thinking for, for the future. And so we spend a lot of our time educating and trying to um, profile who we're talking to and then help them uh, think about their future. I agree with a lot of things that have been said. Uh, maybe to add to this, uh, one of the things that uh, I find uh, exciting is this, uh, which is enabled by you know, telemedicine, is it's really building communities, building this network of care. You know, today is really a one-to-one -one relationship with a physician, a one-to-one -one relationship with a family. But at the end of it, you know, if we are able to really create this community, create this network of care, we really improve the quality of life of many people along the, uh, in, along the continuum. For example, if you take uh, you know, uh, older adults, and we know that the demographics are, are exploding, uh, and that it would be really very difficult to sustain, one of the uh, ways uh, to be able to uh, you know, to have a sustainable, mo sustainable model, it's really about building this community and building this network of care. When you get older, your world becomes smaller. Uh, how to make it bigger? And I think telemedicine and the notion of connected resident is really one way to be able to go into this area. Uh, Tim, I wanted to follow up on a point that you made. In our last session, the doctor was talking about two surveys, one of people who had an existing relationship with the doctor and healthcare system and another who did not. And you know, what's those, those two groups, what's their reaction to telemedicine? And um, uh, it seems that patients are kind of in an all or nothing scenario. Like, well, if I have to talk to the doctor on the computer, does that mean I can't go to the office? And I think it's hard to illustrate the scope and the, well, for heart patients, it might be this kind of experience and for depression, it might be this and for, I mean, does, have you, how do you, um, what are your successful techniques for ex explaining the situation to a certain client? You said you focus yeah. a lot on the Well, that's person. a great question, and I think it's a, it's a challenge because making wholesale change across the health system is incredibly difficult to do. So, you know, when, when we work with our customers, <clears throat> we're tip, typically taking a service line approach. So you're taking, whether you're kind of going down the CHF path or the diabetes path, or whether it's you know um, acute care you know acute care medicine, or um, you know stroke and neurology, we're typically working this way across a disease state, and that makes it very hard from a patient education. How are you, you know? So one patient you're saying it's a telemedicine solution, the next patient who's the cardiac patient, it's not a telemedicine solution. So um, you know I think it's part of this awkward position that we're in in the market. I think what's going to change, as, as was a little bit alluded to, is, is as organizations go whole, wholesale in, so there's sort of a tipping point. When you get to 40% of your, of your patient population is now at risk care, then you kind of incent, you're incentivized to make a wholesale transition. And then we'll, then, then we'll see a lot more broad communication to the consumer market. We'll see more integration into the, to the insurance providers to communicate you know, a new system of care. But I agree with you, right now, it's very fragmented. Yeah, and I think I would like maybe to, uh, to uh, continue on one point that was made earlier, and I think which is related to this, which is this notion of patient-centered care. We are seeing it very you know, clearly. For example, for the elderly market, there is not one size fits all solution. You really need to have solutions that can adapt, that can customize you know, to, the, you know, to the population. It is not about one thing, it's really about a spectrum 
of you know integrated solutions that can really adapt and customize to be able to deliver this patient center care yeah actually uh, this reminds me um, we have an intensive ambulatory care program that is you know being piloted out of uh, banner health in arizona and you know, it was designed for the most sick patients. And a defining feature of that population is that you don't tend to find just diabetics, just COPD, or just any single illness. You see, at a minimum, four to six comorbidities. And so what we found is that the best approach is where you create that care team, the multidisciplinary care team, which consists of, you know, doctors, social workers, nurses, and they have to you know, take a holistic view of each patient, you know, do care planning around that, and deploy telemedicine where it makes sense, which we're finding you know, the video calling functionality, for example, is a huge component of that. The, the patients really love that uh, because you know, there's a lot of elderly people who feel disconnected, their world is small, and just the idea that you know, I can just press a button, reach out to my doctor, and have a conversation with them if I'm anxious, it's a huge, huge, you know, difference in their lives. So we're trying things like that for that population, but as you come down the, you know, the spectrum of patients' costs, uh, you know, you will run into more of these models uh, which, which have to be maybe more disease-centric or at least have to have some more defined archetypes, and there it would again become challenging, you know, how do you tailor it and target it to individual patients? Mm -hmm. Oh, Deb, did you have a comment? Yeah, I think it's been very interesting. And you know, I've worked in uh, and supported somehow the telemedicine efforts of the ATA for the last 12 plus years. And in the early days, you know, you really thought about um, getting out to the rural communities and having a point to point call. And you used the term telemedicine that covered a lot of different types of specific uh, con consultations. And I think what's happened is with the emergence of the new model that there's. Um, that, that term of telemedicine, you, know, you talk to somebody at a dinner party and you say, oh, we're doing telemedicine, it's so broad that it makes it very hard to make it applicable. And it's also not necessarily from the patient's point of view, right? If you ask a patient, do you want telemedicine, they're going to not necessarily know what that means. But if you talk about patient-centered care, and we want to get you the best connections that you can to the doctors you need, the nurses you need, the other people in your community that have the same problem, mm -hmm. that's the terminology that they can identify with. So as much as it helps a lot of us talking about what needs to be done to use the category of telemedicine, I think when you're really working with the health systems and you're working with the patients, you need to put it in the terms of, we're going to help you tr have better transitional care. And that may include video for your discharge planning. It could include video for your medications management. It could include video for compliance. You're going to look me in the eye and tell me that you're going to eat that good diet and you're going to exercise. And, and then it could be that video for your follow-up visit. So all of those things, I think, are better, easier for the health systems to relate to, right? Discharge planning is, can be challenging. Um, but in reality, you're going to have telemedicine be a part of all of that. And just with discharge, I, my father was sick recently and I thought, man, I wish I had videotaped those instructions because you know you're focused on getting out of the hospital and do I take mm -hmm. this pill then and this pill and what about this? And you're just so, it's such an emotional time that if I had a video, I could replay it and say, oh. Well, not so only that, that really like, if I may, not only that, like, I, you know, personally, I live in the Boston area. My folks, when they were alive, lived in Los Angeles. And you, we'd have the situation where one of them would get sick and it, all my brothers and I would figure out what did the doctor say, what's going on with you, mm -hmm. what is going to happen. Imagine if we were able to come in over video for that discharge plan and say, guess what? Dad and mom can't go home by themselves because neither one of them can read the prescription or get the pharmacy filled. And you need to bring in my cousin so-and-so who lives in LA that can stay with them for the first two or three weeks. So not only would you make sure that there's a successful discharge plan, but you'd also be able to bring in family members, community members, and say they need to be a part of this to make this really successful. And finally, I mean, the thing that was frustrating for me is to get second or third hand what it is that's going on with my mom or dad, right? They would try to tell you, and they aren't really giving the whole picture. So I think being able to connect across all of those aspects um, is, is being done through video, but it's a little bit different than talking about telemedicine. Well, I, I might just add that I think if you think about what's the most effective health care, it's about communication. Yep. I mean, really, what we're talking about today is how do we communicate better with our patients? How do we provide better care? And I think as a group, the ATA sort of has to stop talking about telemedicine, talk about this is an effective way to provide tele uh, communication in the 21st century. And what we've seen is you just think of the paradigm where, and again, where I come from is the ICU, but 
The doctor on call takes a call at night over the phone. That's the historic way we've done this in probably 90% of the hospitals in this country. So the nurse has to somehow describe for the physician what's going on with that critically ill person. The paradigm completely changes when you can see that patient. And that's what we've sort of been doing for six or eight years now, really. But I think as a group, we need to be talking that this is a way to improve communication between patients and doctors in a multitude of different approaches. So it's not just the idea of, well, you can see the person in the hospital, but can you see that person after the hospital? And can you see that person at home? And I think we need to talk about that more and more because that's when the barriers start to come down. I mean, once the patient's experience on a visit in a high definition audio video from a physician, that barrier goes away. But you can't sort of do that one person at a time. I think so we need to be talking more about that this is a communication tool that allows everybody to get on the same page. And you're right, it's much easier to do it in, in a picture than it is to try to figure out what someone said secondhand. Probably our area actually is the easiest sell for the patient because um, you know when you push the envelope on telemedicine and you go into the austere environments, it's almost a relief for um, our patients to see mm. uh, the, the, the person on the screen. So if you mm. go, let's say, in the expat community working in a a uh, Western company, but maybe in a developing country, and you can hook them up uh, with either a Western ER doctor or their own pre PCP via telemedicine. I mean, it's a it's a it's a relief actually. It's, it's a, that's an easy sell. Or maybe the travel industry, if you're you're somewhere in the Caribbean, let's say, and you're ill or injured, and you're able to be hooked up with a um, either again a Western ER doctor or your own PCP through telemedicine. It's it's quite a relief. So you know that's probably the easiest sell for patients is when you start getting into these austere applications. Well, certainly we had situations where we did. A project in Nevada with a large urban hospital connecting to critical access hospitals. And literally on a Friday, that, those hospitals had zero specialists on their staff. Now again, all medicine's local. There are people that would be transferred immediately because there was something wrong with them, and there were people that would never be transferred out of their local community because they wouldn't go to Las Vegas. Well, from a Friday where there were zero specialists to a Monday, there were 25 specialists on staff in that hospital in three different disciplines. So that just changes the paradigm of care in that hospital. And again, it, it doesn't matter to the people in that hospital how we did that. Yep. We just have to be able to yep. prove that we can do it effectively. And so that's, where I think, where the, where, where the next steps are. And I think you had an excellent point around this connection because if I take it back to the situation with my parents or when you have an elderly person that's, that's just gotten out of the hospital for congestive heart failure, they're terrified. Mm -hmm. Their partner's terrified. Mm -hmm. And you can have a phone call, but if you can actually see the doctor, you can see the nurse, and you can make that connection, that takes that fear away. That makes them feel like, okay, yeah. everything's going to be okay because they see you. They see what's going on. That wasn't in my hospital in Boston, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, my parents were in L.A. You oh, okay, safe. Right. <laughs> We've talked a lot about patients, but um, I also think about how this affects doctors and nurses and all healthcare providers because whenever someone complains too much about their doctor, I'm like, well, you know, they got their own set of problems and they're under a lot of stress too. So some of these solutions can make life and a career easier for doctors and nurses and all yeah. healthcare providers. Well, we've certainly found that if you think about what I do, and again, go back to the ICU, where if you are a physician working in the ICU at night, you have a 12 hour shift, or you could be a telemedicine physician at home, which is how our model works, and see, cover three or four small hospitals, the same pay, and you're at home. I mean, so I think from the standpoint of physician, they have that, there's an opportunity for them. In addition, specialty coverage frequently is an issue because physicians don't want to drive in their car to a hospital. So you see this, for example, in the neurology world where more and more neurologists have withdrawn from medical staffs because they can do just as well and have a better life if they're only in the office. They do their EEGs and their EMGs and they see their outpatients and they don't really need the hospital. But you know what, the hospital needs them. And so if you can provide that coverage, um, you can make it so that it's a little easier for the physician. And even in urban settings where it's hard to get around town. I mean, I've driven in Boston yep. plenty of times. <laughs> it's not so easy to get from your office if it's not within 10 minutes of the campus. It might take you an hour. Well, you can, you can, you can overcome that as well. So I think there's lots of ways that physicians can benefit from, from this. Okay. I think we have the potential of really, you know, bring a paradigm shift and redefine the job of many people in the industry. If you look today at the amount of time that the physician you know, uh, spend moving paperwork, you know, kind of uh, communicating in a way that is not effective, in, and nurse you know, also, I think by taking uh, advantage of uh, uh, you know, connectivity, for example, to develop solutions that will take out of their job the amount of time that they spend at things that they are not necessarily good, and really having them focusing on the places where they can add value 
where you know they they've been studying for many years, for example, to do that. Then we can redefine basically a lot of you know things in the healthcare industry. And another thing that I think you know, you know we need to think about. You know, today we are talking about telemedicine. We are talking about patient. What about what about you know talking about connected uh, resident or, or what about talking about person? But at the, at the end of it, it's really about you know a more holistic view of health. It's not really about physical or when we are sick. You know, and, and we tend to focus in you know, a kind of a lot of these solutions when you know we have a, a crisis. But at the end of it, it's also about social. It's also about mental. It's about emo uh, uh, emotional state. All these things are you know kind of uh, needs to come together. You know, you know, to be able to really you know change what healthcare is about. Yeah, I fully concur with that. You know, uh, I mentioned that intensive ambulatory care program. We, I think, when we started it. We thought it was going to be primarily a medical model. Mm -hmm. And over you know, months of doing that, one of the starkest realities that we are fully facing is that you know, half or more of it is psychosocial in nature. It is entirely you know, about how people are able to feel about themselves and manage mm -hmm. themselves. Mm -hmm. And if they do that, they have a lot more success in their you know, clinical outcomes as well. So fully agree that you know, at the end of the day, all of that matters more. Uh, coming back to the physicians themselves, I remember you know, a couple of interesting conversations with my friends who are doctors, and you know, one of them put it in a really simple manner. He said that, look, I just spent years getting educated and trained as a physician. The thing I want to do most is see as many patients as possible, you know, help as many patients as possible. And at the end of the day, Telemedicine by you know removing that driving time, all those other barriers of you know how much you can do, it's a great thing for them. And I mean, he just is so excited about this you know changes that are coming into our healthcare industry where where this is becoming more and more acceptable. And so I really think this is actually you know some of them have not fully embraced it. Some of the physicians I think have. Uh, it's not so much that they don't agree with telemedicine, but where I've experienced some resistance is that, you know, if they are accustomed to uh, taking full care of a patient and then you start seeing, you know, other connections from other physicians who they don't necessarily know, sometimes that might make some physicians nervous, you know. I would just make the point that our experience has been, though, that if the physician who's on the ground has the face-to-face -face conversation with the physician who's the telemedicine physician, then that barrier starts to melt. Because I think there's a group of, and we tend to be conservative people. That's just who we are in the sense of change is it's hard in medicine, and we try to resist it often. But I think our experience has been that when the surgeon, for instance, has the evaluation with the ICU, tele-ICU physician face-to-face, -face, some of those barriers begin to melt. And, and I think that's really what has to happen. I mean, you talk about a different model when you start talking about people at home and following them. I think that's a key, key thing that telemedicine will grow into. Yeah. is the outpatient follow-up, the patients preventing the readmissions of people who are discharged. Absolutely. I mean, just think about the idea of a patient being leaving the hospital, going to a nursing home, and it takes seven days for a physician to do rounds on that person because they can only go once a week. Well, that's where all the medicine mistakes, or medication ha errors happen. Yep. And because they've got the, both the generic and the brand of, of at least two medicines when they get discharged. And that's very common. Well, if you can break that barrier down by using the communication tool of telemedicine, You've improved care, and you prevented that readmission. Absolutely. And it's that transitional care, I think, that's so important today. And being able to know, like we like, I'm with Polycom, and I like to think about the fact that you can have this uh, video landscape that follows the patient, or that's in place that the patient can take advantage of. So if they happen to be in the hospital, if they're in a skilled nursing facility, if they're at their home, wherever they are, enable them to communicate and collaborate and see whoever they need to be seen by. Exactly. The other part is a physician. I think the part that's really exciting is in addition to the fact that you want to see as many patients as you can, you generally want to know uh, anything that's new and relevant and helpful within a particular area that you may not be a, a specialist. The one that I'm thinking about is I sat in on um, a grand rounds around stroke. Most of those sitting in were neurologists and I'm more uh, focused around prevention and wellness aspects. So there were some things mentioned about um, decreased cholesterol and risk of stroke, 
which I thought was very interesting, something that I wouldn't have thought about. And there were some things around anemia and that implications of risk of stroke. So from a prevention point of view, it's a wonderful thing to be able to have these multi-point interactive encounters where physicians can find out from different aspects of maintaining some patient, what are some of the risk factors, what are some of the ways we can keep them healthy and learn you know, uh, how to improve what we do. And of course, the other part of that, obviously, is if you can sit in on these distant learning experiences. I've been lucky enough to sit in on some dermatology sessions where they're discussing things that haven't been published yet. I mean, that's exciting to be able to see and know what, what's going on in these areas. So I think the other final thing I'll say around the physicians that's been interesting is I get on frequently with people from my home office in Littleton and do video. And in the beginning, I'd say you know, 15, 12, 15 years ago, the physicians were, I think, a lot more reluctant. Today, one of the first questions I get is, how are you doing this? And I'm like, I'm in my home. Can I do this in my home? And I think that is the, you know, a part, very important aspect of this, is how can they be most efficient? How can they do things from the place that makes the most sense? And how can they connect with the other members of the healthcare team and those patients? Mm -hmm. so, well, I assume certainly hospital systems need to expand their reach to physicians. And physicians need to expand their reach to patients. Yes. And as, as, as was said, I mean, I think this is a perfect model to do that. Uh, and I think more and more it's much more accepted. That's the difference I think that's changed over the past five years, certainly. Uh, one of our previous panelists said that it's all about integration now. Everybody has their electronic medical record. Really now it's about how you make it all work together. And a, a couple months ago I talked to a company that they started as a scribing company and then people started asking for help with EHR rollout. So then they combined them both. So you can scribe and EHR. Um, do you see, what are the gaps that we need help with? Or where are the integration, what's the startup company that needs to exist to help with integration? Any investment opportunities you all see in the market right now? I, I, I think that in terms of helping with integration, there is uh, you know, definitely uh, uh, progress to make in terms of uh, integrating and understanding the clinical workflow with the technical know-how. I think you know, they, are, they are coming together, but still in a, there is more, you know, more to do into this area to really develop solutions that are usable, you know, that are really integrated, not only integrated in terms of software, for example, or functionality, but integrated in really you know, the, you know, the, the clinical workflow too. And I think there, you know, there are, if you see a number of you know, you know, software solutions that are you know, developed today, there are, there are progress to make, I think. Sorry. My experience actually, uh, both in this company and one prior that was doing a different kind of telemedicine is that, um, that the EHR is, is, is a little bit problematic because in my experience, they've, they've either been much too complicated and, and, and really very difficult to use or much too simplified and not um, satisfying everything that we need. So, um, you know, when we are doing our uh, application now, and granted our application now really relies on a more simplified EHR than, than perhaps some of these others, you know, we decided to sort of make our own, to, to, to try to create something that was really fitting what we wanted. You know, we wanted it to be data mineable, we wanted this, this, and this, and we didn't want this, this, and this, so we went off and created our own. What's out there in the industry now, there's a number of things out there, I think, and I think there's a lot of improvement um, moving forward with this. I know there's some homegrown things that came out of actually the Boston area, there's one and there's some others. But um, in, in my experience, it's been problematic, the, uh, the HR and, and, and trying to integrate it into, into the practices because <clears throat> the telemedicine practices now are so different. Um, if you look at, you know, even maybe it's just this panel, what everybody's doing, um, there's really different nuances with each one that might require something very unique from the EHR. In our, sorry, so, so we actually, we have quite a bit of experience with this and there's a, there's a lot of, um, <clears throat> there, there's a lot of hype going on around data integration into the EHRs without a lot of realism about how complex and difficult it is both to do and to maintain mm -hmm. and the business models that have to go along to support those and the costs that would be involved in maintaining integration into many, many systems, each hospital different, uh, and, um, uh, and those, those systems that are const they're, they're constantly changing, right? So there's an enormous effort going on on the hospital side with meaningful use and everything to, to, to drive uh, rapid involvement of those data systems. So it's, it's a very complex problem, and what, what kind of getting to the point that was made earlier, what we've learned is that Every specialty or every scenario 
has a most efficient process. And it's very unique to that particular scenario. And so you're kind of between this desire to create something that's efficient and works very well for stroke or for critical care or for cardiology, um, and then at the same time be able to integrate into you know, every lab system, every PAC system, every EHR uh, that, that's out there. And, and so you know, I think our approach has been to be very, um, um, very, very specific about the scenario. If a hospital is moving down the path or a hospital system is everybody's integrating into one system, let that be the scenario. Just use the system that's available. We don't need to do data integration for data integration's sake. However, if you're building networks that are across many, many different systems, from a clinician's perspective, that's just not tenable. I can't remember you know, 20 passwords into 20 systems right. and try to navigate complex EHRs at, that, that are often very complex in their architecture. So you know, I, you know, the answer, in, in, in my opinion, is it's very much a case by case. What's the right solution here? And, um, and try, to, try to keep it simple, because integration is, is costly. Yeah, I would say that in our experience, it's um, so I concur with a lot of things you said. Uh, you know, but but there's a world of a difference between inpatient, the hospital side, and the ambulatory world. The inpatient side, we see more and more standardization. So as much as you know, expensive and difficult it is to do integration, it has gotten better over the years significantly. And Philips actually made a decision a few years ago that you know we have all these software products, telehealth products, and we're going to use a common interface engine so that we never end up you know, doing integrations twice or thrice. And that's been a huge help, because uh, over time it pays for itself. If you come to the ambulatory setting, it is, uh, it's, it's like the wild, wild west. Because <laughs> if you're a health system, you're getting patients you know, from Dr. X, who's you know, two counties away, using paper records, and you know, another affiliated physician who's got actually your same EMR, uh, and you know, somebody from a different system. So that one is, is far trickier, and I think uh, we still have a ways to go for, before anybody solves that. Uh, you know, there's some interesting changes in that space where you're seeing some of these cloud-based EMRs like Athena, you know, Practice Fusion, uh, and others take hold, and if they really are able to create the kind of consolidation we have on the health, uh, on the hospital health system side, like Epic and Cerner and a few others, then, you know, the cost of integration should come down, but it is a big issue. It is absolutely the biggest the, hurdle. Yeah. yeah so I, I think this is really fascinating. Um, you know, I, I started out a few years back by reading the stimulus bill, and then I looked through the Affordable Care Act, and it seemed to me that there was a pattern, right? So what they were doing, if you look at the stimulus bill, is they were pushing more to the community, right? The $2 billion that went to the community health centers. And if you looked at some of the other investments, you could start to predict where the healthcare model was gonna go. And when you look at the stuff that evolved around electronic health records, it was pretty clear, you know, they're gonna try and get all this information together. But it creates a problem because everybody has a different electronic health record. And especially if you take that in the context of the model of care that's coming out, where these ACOs are important. So the, the model is to look at getting different organizations, different businesses to help a patient do better. And that by definition means you're gonna have a lot of different electronic medical records, but yet everybody has to have one. So the second part of that equation, I think, is coming about through these health information exchanges. So if you think about the, the difficult problem of how do you have all these different uh, electronic health records communicating, talking, and doing all this stuff, it is a very hard to maintain complex thing, and in the Wild Wild West version particularly. So the way that you can do that is if you set up a health information exchange that has a standard authentication process for bringing in the practitioners that they have to fill out and be authorized to come in and see certain sets of patients. And on the other side, the electronic health record, whichever one you happen to have, has to have this ability to participate in this, elect in this uh, health information exchange. Then you've got what you really need, especially for the telemedicine aspect, which is any doctor being authenticated, able to see what's happened to that patient before, interacting with their own medical record to keep their data on how they, what they did with this patient, 
But at the same time, the original healthcare team being able to say, oh, that's what the specialist did when they were working with my patient, because they can go into this health information exchange and see what happened. So from, from my perspective, I think that those, as you know, are in transition. There's some states that have HIEs that are functioning. I know in the uh, South Carolina Department of Mental Health uses an HIE, and they are doing telepsychiatry, and they're able to look at that information, and they've, they've got some fantastic numbers, I think. They've saved the state $54 million over the life of their program from 2009 till now. So I think that if, if we can have people embrace the health information exchanges and have that sort of standard uh, authentication that happens from the doctor provider side, and on the other side, say to all those different electronic medical records, big and small, you need to be able to pass this into that repository. So but I guess the question is, what's the business model for HIEs, right? That's what everyone keeps, I'm like, yeah, that's a great idea. And then they say, but no one can make it work. There's no business mm -hmm. model. I guess who would pay for it? I don't know. Well, yeah, particular, and particularly in markets where it's highly competitive. So you have, you know, two or three health systems that are battling it out. And the, there's great hesitancy to, to share and work together. Um, so yeah, getting the business model and the, and the incentives all aligned I, I think I think that's that's a, a, absolutely what everybody is hoping will happen. It's just it's and just is very there a lever out there now pushing that to happen? Because like I live uh, in Indiana and there's like four HIEs in Indiana. I'm like it's not that big of a state. <laughs> Why do we need four HIEs? So maybe I mean, you could give one of yours to some of yeah. the other states and uh, <laughs> yes. speed things up. Um, so uh, let's see where I'm at. That. And maybe in that same context, I like to think back about what happened in the PAX world, right? So we had a lot of different PAXs. They need to share information. You have radiologists at a distance, and that problem, you know, has been solved. People do teleradiology, and they have to use a bunch of different PAX systems. You have DICOM sends. The wrappers that go around those, those images are, is a standard that's uh, published. And so if you want to participate and look at images across systems, you put a DICOM wrapper and you have access. So there should be something that the HIE can do that's uh, similar to that. And I would assume that there's, you know, if they're maintaining this, this uh, data repository, so to speak, that there's going to be fees coming in from the authentication side and there'll be fees coming in for those hospitals so. that are dropping it off. You, you know, the, the hope for HIEs might be the blue button program of the federal government. Because, like you said, you know, there, there isn't enough incentive for all the health systems to work with each other. The same applies to EMR companies. And with this Blue Button initiative, uh, which, uh, you know, it's... Does anyone, everyone know Blue Button? Blue Button? It's pretty simple. There's a Blue Button providers can put on their website, and you should be able to click on it and download your own patient chart. Now, if, if providers really do get on the bandwagon and make it possible for anybody to download their patient chart, hopefully that means, you know, all of these things will be connected because then, then it's a matter of a startup figuring out, you know, if you are, if you're a patient and you want to get all your patient records, maybe you just specify, I work with these health systems and they'll automatically go and get your blue button data. Is anyone worried about bandwidth? I know even here today, people couldn't, the internet was spotty and, you know, my parents live in the middle of rural Ohio and um, we, I just got them a wireless network, and they do have high speed, but of course it goes out a lot. So, I mean, what, how does that affect? Well, bandwidth, I think, is important. Uh, it's a game changer in our field, what we do in austere medicine, um, because uh, just the, the changes in the, in the bandwidth capabilities over the last several years have, have made us uh, actually able to, to use these devices and use the telemedicine in places where you know, we never could before. Um, so in our world, the, 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 the dramatic changes in bandwidth have really um, uh, improved things. And also now we're finding that um, the telemedicine capabilities actually are being, um, through some of these communication systems, et cetera, um, are able to be very um, robust yet um, using very low bandwidth. Um, so the combination of that in the austere medicine world has been, like I said, a game changer. And, and has really, enabled us to go into a lot of areas where we can't. Mm -hmm. I, I was just going to say, America has a lot to learn from some other countries that have much better bandwidth. I mean, ours, and I think ours is like well, the most expensive and the least reliable or something like that, well, yeah, relatively speaking. It depends on where you get it. Depends <laughs> where you get Even it. more than bandwidth, connectivity. I will not, uh, you know, I think it's, uh, it's amazing, actually, especially when you, you deal with uh, uh, elder care or, you know, older, you know, people. Uh, in fact, you know, it's amazing to, uh, you know, see the number of uh, in, in people that do not have connectivity at all. 
uh, and I think uh, when you know, we actually uh, you know, deploy or pilot the system recently where it was a big problem. Yeah. But there so are, I think bandwidth definitely, but even connectivity, also. I think. And there, are, there are solutions for that as well, um, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, with, with uh, really enhanced connectivity in places where they don't have it. Do, um, do, do you guys, so, so the way I think about it is that there's sort of two segments to the telemedicine market at a very high level. There's sort of this acute care side where we're thinking about ICUs and critical care medicine, stroke care, et cetera. And then there's the home chronic disease management, you know, 82 year old mom that we're trying to stay in touch with and we're trying to maintain continuity given her, you know, CHF or whatever. So. And there's a third, right? The one we, we see now is the retail aspect. The people and a growing, that, so, right? so that's, 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 uh, that's also an emerging market. So, I, you know, the way I think about it is the bandwidth issues on the kind of acute care side, frankly, we, we don't run into right. problems. I mean, yeah. most physicians have excellent, yeah. you know, access to internet, whether it's through a 4G card or, you know, at their hospital or their clinic or whatever. And the hospitals have plenty of bandwidth, even small critical access hospitals don't seem to have, have, have problems. But if you're trying to reach mom at home, mm -hmm. you know, and you're trying to develop yeah. a system that's applicable in that scenario, you know, it's, it's more challenging. It's not so much, well, it's bandwidth, but it's also mom who's not comfortable managing bandwidth, mm -hmm. who doesn't know how to, you know, how to maintain a, you know, wireless network in her house or whatever, right? So, yeah. I don't know if there's, there's I, don't know, I don't know about the commercial. There's that and there's the economics of it. I mean, so you're fine typically as long as you're doing, you know, engagement with patients through software or measurements. If you want to do video calls, you know, the cost of having a connection that can support video calls is pretty substantial. It's, it's great if the patient or, or that 82 year old mom has broadband already maintained through whatever means, but if she does not from the beginning have that, installing that. I mean, we all know, you know, we pay $100 plus per month for connectivity for internet. So that is a substantial new cost if you're gonna mm -hmm. uh, keep track of those patients or support those patients. That's, that's a big variable in, you know, mm -hmm. the adoption of those kind of capabilities inside you know, the, the elderly care situations. Mm -hmm. Certainly the opportunity is to connect the two pieces of this though, right? Because Absolutely. acute care, we manage that fairly well. We've got a system in place to do that. Care at home is a, is a market, but really from a hospital standpoint, what I want if I'm running a hospital is the ability to make sure those people, once they go home, are still connected to me as far as follow up, as far as making sure the medications are correct, making sure they don't come back in my hospital within 30 days. We have to bridge those two pieces. And that's also an opportunity, I think, for telemedicine. Maybe we haven't pushed enough, and I, I think we certainly should and could. Yeah, absolutely. And if I could, I think it's interesting because there, there's a transition that's happening in terms of where you can get to and who can have access to this. I think one of the significant ones for me, six years ago when I started working for Polycom and working out of my home office, uh, I, hired, I ordered my home phone, right? And then I get the beautiful Polycom practitioner cart and I'm like, oh, okay, what do I do now? Because I need video. Turns out I just plug in and it's running off of my home phone line and I'm doing these videos from everywhere. That wouldn't have been true six years before that, and I'm sure that there's all these other things that are coming. So it's a transition in terms of how much availability you have, and I also think in how much the elderly are able to do this. I think there's been huge movement with Facebook allowing these elderly to see their grandkids and stuff, that that's, you know, there was a big concern six or seven years ago that you couldn't get them to use these tablets. Now that's becoming a non-issue and it's right. in a transition phase. I think connectivity is in a transition phase. And one of the ways we supplement that transition is thinking about bringing in the community care as a supplement. So if they don't have bandwidth at home, it's easier for them to get into a little community center and hook up with your hospital and say, you know, here I am, I don't want to go back in and well, I'm doing well, this. In some respects, it's contingent upon the hospitals, I think, to do that. I mean, yep. to, to us as the providers, but also as a hospital, I think your, your client-based, you know, you have your service area. I mean, that's something that you have to be thinking about. Yep. So one thing that strikes me about our conversation is the expectations, like maybe older people don't want to have a video conference, but younger people want to be able to have it on their phone right in front of them, never mind being at home. So um, what, what's happening with mobile? Is that the next bridge or we have to get over? Well, I, I would say old people love having video calls. They absolutely do. <laughs> they absolutely. just have a hurdle they have to get past mm -hmm. to actually know how to do it. 
Um, but yeah, no, mobile is a big, big story because now that everybody has their mobile devices, you know, I mean, traditionally uh, doing telemedicine in the home required putting equipment, devices, and some kind of hardware in the home. And you know, if you look at the smartphone of today, it's really your computer, it's your camera, and your phone. So uh, it's just that much harder to introduce new hardware, and you really have to. And we are, you know, in Philips, for example, we're spending considerable considerable amount of resources trying to figure out, you know, how do we deploy things more on, you know, existing hardware rather than introducing new one. But that's a journey. It's going to take us some time. I think others are looking at it the same way. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think when, when we look at the model of continuous care, transitional care, that's not only important that you can reach the patient, but that the doctors, you know, the doctors, and, and we support this, the doctors want to come in on their iPhone. They want to come in on their tablet, or if they're sitting at their desk, they want their big, beautiful display. So we have to, and we currently do, support, you know, the iPhone into any of these video encounters. And that's, you know, to get the doctors what they need and where they need it and as fast as they need it. And then I think with the, with the elderly patients, you know, they're learning to swipe things. I heard a story at the conference here where somebody was going up to a screen trying to swipe it to make it work because the elderly <laughs> was, you know, uh, used to this. So the more that you can um, fit into what, you know, culturally they need to have. They want Facebook. They want to see their kids. They understand the phones. They're getting those in their hands. And they, and I think the comment you meant about how, made about how these elderly worlds can shrink. Yeah. I, I personally think for health and wellness, one of the most important things is to support community. Completely. To have the, the elderly that are sharing a, a problem, get on video, see each other. Maybe they get together even at community health centers and you get all of those hooked together over video and you talk about you know, the problems you're having with your diet or the problems you're having and, and you build that community and then I think they're very excited about getting on and seeing and you know. Completely, we saw exactly the same thing. Uh, you know, actually, we're, we're showing a system where, in fact, you know, we we started by this. We started by loneliness, for example. Yes. Loneliness is a big issue, and of course, you know, all these elder people have a, a lot of other problems. But you know, to be able to improve their quality of life, to be able to make their life better. Uh, trying to you know you know to to reach to their community to the people they love was so essential, and that's why you know that was a starting point. Of course, we need all the other things, and we need to integrate you know these different capability. But uh, uh, we we kind of, uh, as I said earlier, tend to focus you know up to now on physical or crisis, and we need to focus more on these other aspects which are so important for the quality of life. Uh, I think the. Uh, I, well, I'm just going to say, I think the, the mobile devices, I think, are the next generation, the future of this. Um, mobile devices are, are, as we all know, you know, getting better by the, by the minute, by the second, um, and more sophisticated. And, um, for instance, we use mobile devices. We, we provide telemedicine for an, um, a medical clinic in an orphanage in Haiti. And I provide that through a, oftentimes through an iPhone. Now, it's relatively rudimentary right now through the iPhone, but still, it's still possible. Um, and this is only going to get better. And you know, when we talk about how do we convince maybe the elderly and some others to be able to use this technology, not you know, I think the elderly do like to use it if, if you show them how to use it. But but the reality is that's going to work its way out because the the, the younger population is so um, uh, integrated into their iPhone, it's almost an appendage of their body. And I think it's actually going to be us trying to catch up with them yeah. versus you know we trying to teach them how to keep up with us. Maybe instead of calling it telemedicine, we should call it FaceTime with your doctor. I think yeah. FaceTime is becoming a verb, just like Googling became a verb. I think FaceTime is, is getting there. Um, are there any questions from the audience? We have um, about 10 minutes left. Questions? Yeah. Uh, so Tom Lisk, Sarah San Diego. And I was wondering on this adoption question, whether or not, uh, picking up on the point you were just raising, which is, will uh, younger people who are so accustomed to using their phones and 16-year-olds Uh, will they start saying, you know, I really don't have time to go visit the doctor. I know I have to get my annual physical. Can't they just send me a kit, or can't I get a vaccination through some Band-Aid that I put on and it has a drug delivery system, and they will maybe infuse it into my body for the next week? And so that really migrates us away from telemedicine into telehealth. And just, just so you appreciate my approach from T.S. Sarah, I go to CES where I see too many undifferentiated wearable devices for the 
worried well or the fitness nuts. Way too and many. Those <laughs> ones who are really differentiating themselves are aligning with uh, wellness providers like Vitaly and their deal with Fitbit. And, then, and that's going to be a winner. And then you have Nike on the other end of the spectrum scaling theirs down or, or maybe refitting it. And then here you have everybody chasing the CHF patients to make sure they stay out of the hospital 60 days after discharge. And, and where is the where's the real scale in between? I guess that's, that's my a good question. question. Well, I, I, would, I would answer that in two parts. First of all, on the wearable side, there's too many providers who've gone after a single proposition, mm -hmm. right? Because they just want to treat one thing, just want to track your diabetes, just want to track your ventilation and so on. And I think that doesn't work because, again, patients have more than one thing going on in their life. And, uh, you know, point solutions about one illness are, you know, they, they're going to be popular in some segments, but they're not going to be popular with providers because if you're a doctor, you don't want to know just one piece of information. So, so that's one of the challenges with the wearables and how people have approached that. But bringing it back to adoption, I think the biggest unsolved nut here is how do you make this fit inside the health system and how providers take care of patients? It's really got to be a model that embeds itself. You know, we were talking about this earlier. You know, a few years from now, we shouldn't really be talking about telemedicine. We should really be talking about healthcare, and this would be embedded inside it. And so for Philips Healthcare, that means, you know, we actually design programs. We say, you know, we, we create telehealth-enabled programs. So we want to come and tell you how you may want to manage your most expensive top 5% patients or your frail elderly or another, you know, population cohort. But for that particular cohort, what we are designing is not just telemedicine or telehealth-based. It's really how you would care for that population overall. And our hope is, and I think we're seeing the needle pointing in that direction, whereby when you take that holistic approach uh, and you pepper it with you know, the right amount of telehealth, but also software and clinical decision support for labor efficiencies, because you know, you'll be watching, I mean, at the end of the day, economics have to work as well. And if you can put one team against, you know, 50 patients versus 500 patients could be all the difference. And in the same way, you have to engage patients, encourage them to do more self-management because that's also a source of efficiency. Uh, you know, that's, to us, that's the direction this has to take for the adoption to really change and get much better. I, I think the other piece of it is that we'll see the health plans. So as these models evolve, the health plans will start to develop uh, plans, specific healthcare plans that incent that kind of personal health management behavior. So we, you know, we've got some evolution. First, we have to kind of understand what these plans of care look like and, and get adoption in the market. And essentially, you, know, you have to kind of imagine this thing that goes across the continuum where patients are really never discharged, right? It, it's, mm -hmm. You're part of a system mm -hmm. and you're always part of a system. And then the health plans need to come in and design the incentive systems that align, whether it's an ACO model or, or something else. And, and you know, we've had, I think that's starting to happen. So it's, it's, it'll be very interesting. You'll be encouraged. You, you'll, you'll have an incentive to, mm -hmm. to self-monitor to self -monitor and to participate and to adopt certain technologies in your life. If I could just add to that as well, I think that the, the toughest thing, there's so many tough things about getting everything in line, but one of the toughest things is how do you really have someone make a change? You gotta figure out, okay, what is it they need to do to be well, and then how do you encourage them to do that so that they actually are well? And that's very tricky because depending on the person, it can have uh, different, there's different incentives. You might take some money off their insurance bill if they stop smoking, or you might uh, give them three massage therapy sessions if they lose weight, or you know, there's, there's ways to, to, to motivate people through reward that way. But I really think that there's a, that's a very interesting question of how do you really get somebody to change? I, I personally think that um, the comments that we've made about having these social encounters, I think pe this peer-to-peer -peer medical education, peer-to-peer -peer influence, having somebody see you, I think is a very important thing. If you're gonna be working on a weight management plan or you're working on smoking cessation and you have people that are like you, sharing positive stories, you have somebody monitoring, like 
set up this multipoint interactive video thing. You have somebody that's an expert in nutrition, somebody that understands psychology, getting this group to really work together. It goes back to, I uh, heard someone not too long ago talking about My, uh, Maslow's hierarchy, right? People have to feel safe, and then they have to feel like they belong, then they have to feel reward and recognition. I think we can use something like that to motivate people into actually making a change and supplement that with financial incentives. So I think for the bigger change, it's the social aspect of really how do we use collaborative video, is what I'm thinking is going to be very helpful, to get people together, form these peer groups, and have them help each other with guidance through experts over video. And looking at this from Maslow's point of view and the hierarchy, have them belong to something. They're belonging to this group. Have them recognized for their successes, and then have them be able to more proactively take part in their health. Any other questions? Yes. I think the only way you're going to be able to incentivize like that is with data. It's a matter of just going out there, doing some of the stuff, gathering the data, and showing the savings, showing the improvement um, in, in, in how you do it. I mean, when you look at some, you know, say, mm -hmm. applications that uh, you do in the prison systems, let's say, or some others, if you can, you know, show, and there's, there's been a recent paper out actually in the New England Journal about this, um, specific to the prison system, if I'm not mistaken, but. Um, uh, you know, you show actually a cost savings, that goes a long way to, uh, to change minds on that level. Now, I don't think you're ever going to change the mission of the FDA. I mean, the FDA yeah. is there to protect the population. They're going to, I mean, they're going to legislate, uh, you know, they're going to rule on, on what needs to be cleared, what doesn't need to be cleared. It's, it's the other barriers, you know, it's, it's the credentialing, it's the reimbursement barriers. I mean, those things, I think, you know, the ATA is doing a great job of of chipping away at those things, but it's, it's just hard work. And if I may, on sure. that one, what I think's been interesting is watching that over time, right? So 12 years ago, and counting up till the point of the Affordable Care Act, um, we really didn't see CMS releasing new telemedicine codes at all. It was just, you would lobby and hope that that was gonna happen. And what was really amazing to me was after the Affordable Care Act, that following January, we had a big group of reimbursement codes dump out. And what was really interesting about those, I thought, was they had to do with things like uh, group behavioral health, you know, starting mm -hmm. to bring people together. And it had to do with dialysis and prevention kind of mechanisms. Those were the codes that were coming out. And I was like, wow, this is amazing that CMS came out with all these codes, like, boom, right? And then the next step after that, around the credentialing and privileging, I think it was in March when I saw stuff starting to come out from the ATA saying that, you know, this has been an issue over the years. And by June, we had a law that gave an alternative method for credentialing and privileging. I mean, this is unheard of in terms of the speed with which things have moved in order to enable this. And I'm hoping that there are, you know, more efforts to, that come out in this type of a time frame to support this new model of care. So yeah, I would say, I would just say that you know, if you think our government is slow, you should go and check out some of the other <laughs> markets. <laughs> it was enlightening for me when I spent a couple of week, weeks in Europe and Asia. Um, I think Singapore is an exception to this, but other than Singapore and United States, everyone else is far behind, needs to catch up. Uh, someone this morning said there is no telemedicine in Korea. It's just not. It just doesn't happen. So, that's an example of what you were saying. So, so Dr. Ludwig, what are the chances of uh, national credentialing happening? Good question. Um, difficult issue. Um, <laughs> I think that, that certainly our model, you know, when we're doing work in hospitals, I think then it's contingent upon us as a company, for instance, to make sure that our doctors are licensed and credentialed in the hospital staff, because our model is a clinical model. Having said that, I think if you look at the other side of health, health which is outpatient evaluations, that's a different animal in some respects with respect to credentialing. But I'll just bring the, back the issue that I mentioned earlier in, in, as we were talking. Credentialing's there for a reason. Um, you find stuff. Um, physicians, as a group, aren't necessarily 100% honest about their track record. And so... They're human like the rest of us. <laughs> like the rest of us, exactly. And so there's a reason why there's a credentialing committee in a hospital. 
and there are many physicians who can't get on the hospital medical staff for various reasons. So are those the people we want to be doing telehealth at home? I'm not certain that's the case. So I think we as an entity, telemedicine entity, have to be careful about the idea that if you're licensed in one state, you can do this in 50 states. I think we have to be careful about that. Um, I'm not against that necessarily, but I just put up a red flag that personally, you know, we have a group of 100 physicians and 25 hospitals nationwide with critical care. We find issues when we do the background checks and the drug tests and the credentialing. I'll just give you, for instance, our company made a deal with a large hospital corporation. And I've been in practice for over 25 years. And I had to go get a drug test for the first time in my career. And I'm sitting in the room with a bunch of school bus drivers <laughs> and a bunch of police, policemen. There's no doctors, there's no nurses. And I'm looking around saying, I mean, I've been practicing forever. I've never had a drug test asked of me. So the school bus drivers do. So then, you know, we basically put a policy in place that everybody that wants to work with us has a drug test. And there was a lot of pushback from the physicians. Like the so I think we just need to be thinking about that in the terms of break down the walls of credentialing, break down the walls of licensing, let's do telemedicine everywhere. But just remember, there's a reason why we credential people. And that would be the only case I would make about that. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I just think I have that. I think we have to be careful. One last question, anyone? anyone? Change is the only constant, I think, is a good mm -hmm. way to close our panel. Thank you very much, everyone, for your time, and thank you for your attention. Thank you.